Thanks, uh, Ron, for your uh, welcome, and uh, thank you, Gail, to and for all your work this this year. Uh, you and Chandra um, making the uh, machine run. Um, I just turn up, um, but they make it all happen. And thank you for turning up today in this uh, as winter starts setting in. Um, let me tell you a bit about. Um, uh, today's guest and today's speaker, um, Ifyomo uh, Kidu Nwankwo is an associate professor of English at Vanderbilt. She uh, earned her PhD from Duke, where she specialized in African American and Latin American studies. Her focus of research is on relations between African American, Caribbean, and Latin American communities represented in literature, in film, popular music, and everyday life. Her book, uh, uh, the, the, the book she wrote in 95, Black Cosmopolitanism, is a comparative study of the worldviews of people of African descent in the US, in Cuba, and uh, the British West Indies in the wake of the Haitian Revolution. Recent volumes include African Routes, Caribbean Roots, Latino Lives, published this year, and the forthcoming Rhythms of the Af Afro-Atlantic World, co-edited with uh, Mamadou Diouf with Columbia. Her articles have appeared in many places, including American Literary History, Radical History Review, and Callaloo. And they include articles like The Promise and Peril of U.S. African-American Hemispherism, and Douglas's Black Atlantic, the Caribbean, or Caribbean, as you say. She was, uh, before she came to Vanderbilt three years ago, she was co-director of the Atlantic Studies Initiative at the University of Michigan that connected scholars from the US, and Brazil, and Senegal, Puerto Rico, and England. And she's the founding director now at Vanderbilt of Voices from Our America as you see on the screen here. It, with, this is an international project that puts scholarly research methods to work in the service of teaching and public outreach. She describes this Voices project as, and I put it, a quote from her, um, uncovering previously inaudible, silenced, or neglected American voices. As a philosopher, this is particularly interesting to me because it promises both to change the way in which we see the world when we realize that there's a lot of stuff out, out there that we're not noticing or not listening to or not seeing. And it also addresses big questions like questions of justice and representation. When we hear people's stories, and quite a lot of what uh, Ifeoma has been doing is recording uh, people's t stories about their lives, when we hear their stories, they cease to be mere statistics. They come alive. And it's then really hard to ignore them. And a truly radical democracy of the sort that we could be proud of is surely one in which all our voices are heard in all manner of ways. Please welcome uh, Ifeoma Kidu Nwankwo. I will forget. Teach me, and I will learn. Involve me, and I will learn. I continue working after I got this job for 71 years. This guy came one. back from Jamaica. You know, I, when I was in Jamaica the last time, and he told me about the story. He said that this guy was walking down the street. I have an encounter with some. I remember once I was going home, I was living in San Miguelito, and I was speaking in English. Everybody can say, Oh, let me be solo. Yo quiero una mujer para más amar mía. Yo quiero una mujer que sepa cocinar. Que sabe lavar y sabe planchar. Y cuando vengo del trabajo. These are voices from our America. 
These are voices of living, listening, learning history. The Voices from Our America Project recovers histories of West Indian Panamanian experience, increasing the quantity and quality of primary sources available to lay people, researchers, teachers, and students. No, we weren't Americans, we were aliens, really came from the West Indian Island and whatnot. And not only that, I was born here on, in Panama, but I was uh, working for the United States government and born under the United States flag that you wasn't a citizen because this was not there. This is Panama, which is a fact. The folks expressed it as they go to Canada Zone. They didn't care to come here to Panama because they would say we're not, we're not honored. We were a man without, it was actually like a man without a country. Born under the flag, you're not American. Living in Panama, we were considered Panamanian. As a youth, I had marched different times when sovereignty in 1964 when the uh, violent things happened I, I witnessed it I'll be honest to you in Panama they don't talk too much about West Indies they talk about Chumbo and uh, when they use the, the, the term Chumbo it's like uh, to hurt you like an insult, but that actually is not an insult. That was a word used by Christopher Columbus when he landed here in Panama and he saw a black Indian. She was wild, she didn't have on any clothes, and her hair was very straight. Her hair was that long and they covered her bus. And the first she seen a white man. And when he said, Venga Kamichomba, she ran. A veces, a primera, me, mol me incomodo mucho, todavía pasa en este país, todavía pasa que, eh, casualmente en estos días, eh, me paró un guardia de tránsito. Y cuando yo me digo, ¿usted dónde trabaja? No, yo soy el dueño del restaurante. ¿Usted es el dueño? <risa> yo, yo, me, yo ahí me di cuenta nuevamente, porque uno, se, uno a veces se olvida, porque los que te conocen ya te saludan oh, y te respetan porque saben quién eres. Pero una persona extraña que te ve en la calle me mira tres veces y me pregunta, ¿usted es el dueño? Usted tiene que ver con el color de la piel. A veces me quieren decir que es por la edad. No, no, yo creo que más que nada hay los prejuicios o los estereotipos que se han ido creando. Good afternoon, everyone. I am thrilled to see everyone. Uh, thrilled to be able to share with you a little bit about the Voices from Our America project. Um, I will say, first of all, uh, this is what we do in terms of foregrounding the voices of other people. Right? I am the professor, I'm the scholar, all of that, but I wanted you to hear their voices first, uh, and then I will talk with you to help uh, contextualize that. Uh, it is really a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you today, and I'd like to extend a few special thank yous, if you'll allow me, uh, to uh, David Wood, of course, uh, the Vanderbilt Office of Community, Neighborhood, and Government Relations, and uh, Gail Williams, and the Nashville Public Library for this wonderful uh, invitation. Uh, I'd also like to express a special thank you to the Voices from Our America team. Uh, you see one member here, uh, Stephanie Pruitt, we also have uh, Teresa Flores, who's a PhD student in Peabody. Uh, we have Destiny Birdsong, who's a PhD student in the English department, and many other uh, team members here locally. We have team members in Michigan, team members in Panama, all over, people dedicating their time to doing uh, this kind of work. I also, of course, want to acknowledge uh, the, the, our supporters, uh, which is quite vital to the, uh, us actually being able to do what we do. Uh, and that includes the College of Arts and Science at Vanderbilt, the Department of English, uh, the Vanderbilt Center for Latin American Studies, the Robert, P Robert Penn Warren Center for the Humanities, and the Vanderbilt International Office. So there, there may be moments where I will walk away from the podium because I really am not a kind of stand, stand still at the podium person. I do talk pretty loud, so hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, my presentation today will be structured as follows. I'll begin with an overview of the project of Voices from Our America. Uh, giving you a sense of what we've been doing, where we're going, what our goals are. I'll zoom in and focus on one segment of it, which is what you saw a clip from, uh, the segment of the project in Panama. 
Uh, and then I'll talk about, about our, the present and future of what we're doing here in Middle Tennessee. And I will invite you to participate and invite you to join in in that work. Um, we, are, we are working here and growing here. So I will step away to the... All right. <laughs> Do people always try to step away? Yeah. And you all can't hear them? <laughs> I'm just different, sorry. Okay. Quote from Langston Hughes. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plains seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream, the dreamers dreams. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man cr be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you who mumbles in the dark? And who are you who draws that veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery's scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog of mighty crush the weak. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet, I swear this oath, America will be. So what is Voices from Our America? Voices from Our America is an international scholarly project that uses oral history and life history interviewing as a basis to build towards this vision of America in which all voices are heard, in which everyone's stories and histories are valued, and in which our connections within and across racial, geographical, and socioeconomic boundaries are paramount. Voices from Our America has two core goals. One, generating new primary sources on American communities for which there are little or no primary sources or for which there are major gaps in the known source base uh, on specific topics. And two, modeling, guiding, inspiring, and facilitating the use of those new primary sources for and by scholars, K through 12 teachers, youth, and community organizations. Yes, it is a huge undertaking. Yes. It is broad. Yes, it is working. Our process is as follows. We identify communities that could benefit from this work. We've created a template process that we can use or tweak to a particular community's needs. Then we identify local partners that will be community organizations, museums, libraries like this one. Um, thirdly, we identify key issues within those communities uh, using archival research and through regular meetings and conversations with community members. So if you have a community organization, we will come and sit with you and talk with you and ask you, what are you interested in about your community? What are questions? What are issues? Are there particular individuals in your community who you know carry a particular story that would be of value to your community? Then, from those conversations, we formulate a specific questionnaire based on issues identified through research and on input from community partners. Uh, we then conduct the interviews. The interviews are done by our team as well as by local individuals who are trained uh, to conduct these interviews. They are recorded by audio, video, or photography uh, in very many, uh, very, many, uh, very many cases, and we always uh, proceed in accordance with the respondent's wishes. So if you decide that you want to do a Voices from Our America interview, we will give you a form in which you will be able to decide whether you want the interview recorded by audio, whether you want it recorded by video, whether you want it made public, or whether you want it kept private. Then, and most importantly for us, we use the interviews for creative workshops, programs, courses, and educational materials for teachers, youth, and community members. Why are we doing this? We are aiming to integrate uh, unheard American voices and first-hand perspectives into youth and community education and K through 16 curricula. That includes your voices, that includes others, other individuals' voices. Our presumption 
uh, in connection with what Langston Hughes said is that all voices are vital. All voices are important to the achieving of that democratic, uh, broadly democratic vision of America, that we must all be heard and all our voices must be, must be valued. I suspect there's also a philosophical connection in that sense that the need, the, the need to be recognized being a fundamental aspect of the human condition. Uh, we are also working to create digital and print materials that ensure the longevity and wide dissemination of knowledge about individual community members and community organizations' histories. Uh, we are actively seeking answers to fundamental questions. How do we more fully integrate these voices into K through 12 curricula so that young people coming up, if you're five years old, six years old, wherever you're living, if you're living in Nashville, if you're living in uh, Bell Mead, if you're living in Green Hills, if you're living in Murfreesboro, that by the time you're 10 years old, you already know a lot about your history and your community. How do we do that? How do we make that happen? Um, that it's not just the older person in the community who knows who has the stories, who holds the community stories. What methods can we use in order to do that? Second, how can we, uh, how can these, how can visual narratives, and, and here I uh, give credit to my colleague, Professor Lou Outlaw, who is the project photographer, how can visual narratives function alongside print to tell the story of a community? If you get a chance to come up here and look at these photographs, you will see that in a single expression, in a snapshot taken uh, at a moment, you can see a story, right? So that stories are not just through print, stories are not just verbal, but that stories are told through photographs. So how do we capture that? How do we make sure to utilize that for educational purposes? Our current focus is on men and women over 60 in Panama, the Caribbean diaspora, and right here in Middle Tennessee. Uh, in Panama, we're seeking to gain and provide information on questions such as, what is the nature and location of the uh, residual presence of West Indian culture among Panamanians of West Indian descent? You may know that people from the British Caribbean ended up in Panama because of us, uh, the US, right? Anyone here have not know anyone who worked on the canal or any uh, connection with Panama? Yeah, there's someone back there. There are quite a few people who I've met here locally who say that my grandfather did something with a canal. Our very own Commodore Vanderbilt had some money uh, involved in the canal. So British West Indians came from places like Jamaica and Barbados to Panama uh, to work on the Panama Canal. So what I'm talking about are their descendants. So the questions I'm looking at there in Panama are questions about what does heritage look like? What does heritage look like? When you look at someone or you listen to someone, what is it that you're looking for? Think about for yourself, if you are from a particular community, what is it that you're looking at someone to see whether, to measure whether they are truly connected with your community or not? So what does uh, heritage look like or sound like? Uh, is it through language? Do you see it in food? Do you see it in ethics, kind of system of values that the person has? Uh, what determines how they become that? Another crucial question that, uh, that we're asking in Panama is what is the impact of the U.S. presence, right? Because we have been there for a very long time. We just left in 1999, and now there's a huge influx of U.S. people. And some of you may have friends who are retiring in Panama or friends who are buying property in Panama or friends who are sending their money down there in Panama to avoid taxes in the U.S. There's a lot of U.S. presence in Panama uh, right now. So what is the impact of that on uh, modern-day West Indian Panamanians? In terms of African American communities, the questions that we're looking at are what impact can, can knowing more about your community's history have on a young person in a disadvantaged or marginalized community? What new strategies, techniques, programs, and measures can be developed to find answers to that question? Uh, very important, this one. What life skills do elders in a particular community have? that can be conveyed to young people? And what are the best strategies for conveying that? Right, because uh, of course, part of what life experience gives you is you've come up against a lot of things, come up against a lot of battles, and now you have developed skills for how to deal with those. How do we con convey those? Because some of you who have grandchildren know that it's not necessary that they're gonna come and ask you and sit quietly while you explain it to them, right? We know that. So the question uh, for us as teachers and for us as people who are trying to convey information, how do, we convey, how do we help that intergenerational transfer of information and knowledge? 
Uh, and finally, what we're, we're looking at in the U.S. is, in general, is the power of autobiography, what I call the power of autobiography. How can knowing, understanding, or connecting to the life history of a particular individual within a community have an impact on young person, a young person's decision making about their own personal and professional life? Again, the power of autobiography. What does someone, a young person hearing your story, what impact can that have on him or her? And how do we make, uh, how do we make that happen? So in terms of disciplinary perspectives, um, you, you may be thinking of anthropology, you may be thinking a little bit of sociology. This project is multidisciplinary. I'm a literary scholar. You say, what is an English professor doing talking to people? English professors are not supposed to talk to people. English professors are supposed to sit and look at books, right, and look at archives. I've done that, and I do that. Um, but books are filled with the stories of individual people. And so I, I guess I'll say this a little, a little bit stubbornly, I refuse to leave talking with actual people to sociologists and anthropologists, right? We as literary scholars and as humanists in general, uh, our work is informed by the stories of individual people. So why should we leave that? Why should we leave that work? I love, I, I have colleagues who are sociologists and I, I um, we, we connect very much in terms of methodology, but I think it's vital that I as a literary person uh, become involved. Um, part of where I see the literary element uh, part, uh, coming into this work that we're doing is in the construction of questionnaires. So part of what literary people do is think about hidden, hidden meanings, right? We look at a paragraph that someone has spoken in. What is the hidden meaning? What is the silence? Where is the silence? What we try to do in the creation of the questionnaires is to anticipate where the silence is going to be and ask questions that undo the silence or that help the silence to not happen. Does that, does that make sense? Do you hear what I'm, right? So that as a literary scholar, because I, we know how to read texts, how to read autobiography, we use that to inform the construction, uh, the construction of our questionnaire. So Voices from Our America is very literary. It's a literary critical project. It is a uh, bars from sociology, bars from anthropology uh, as well. Importantly though, our goal is not to capture a representative sample. As a literary scholar, I am interested in an individual person's autobiography, an individual person's story. I'm not interested so much in whether you're representative or not, um, but what is your story? What is it that you're trying to convey? What is it that you're trying to communicate? And how is it that you see yourself? What is it that you want the world to know about you? And that is what we are trying to capture and convey to that, uh, to that second, uh, second generation. So looking at Panama, thinking a little bit about Panama, we have accomplished quite a bit in Panama, and you'll, we'll have some slides on that a little bit, uh, little bit more. We have conducted over 100 interviews in Panama so far. Um, and these interviews are quite long. They, they uh, range from about 45 minutes to there's one that was three hours and 45 minutes long. Um, don't worry if you choose to do an interview with us, you decide how long the interview is. Um, we will capture your story uh, however long you, you wish to talk. Um, we have published a photographic essay um, with Professor Lou Outlaw. We are transcribing and processing the interviews. We have done, this, uh, this says over 20, we've actually done over 30 workshops and events there uh, locally and we are providing now opportunities through the Center for Latin American Studies here at Vanderbilt for teachers here locally to connect with teachers in Panama and to begin to um, use that methodology with, uh, here, uh, here in uh, Middle Tennessee as well. We have done work in partnership with the U University of, Pan of Panama. One of the things that we've done is an oral history workshop uh, with the students at the University of Panama, conducted, conducted interviews, viewed our interviews, and they actually created a play uh, based on one of the interviews. So again, something that can come out of it, if you're thinking about doing an interview with us, for example, is a play based on your life, a play based on your experience, which again, as we know with, with the younger generation, you do visuals, you do play, you do performance, that works, right? That connects. So as a university, as scholars, uh, we, and, and as students, we can produce this kind of material so that the story is processed by young people and used uh, in their community, used locally. We have a newsletter through which we keep in touch uh, with organizations. 
Uh, we have collaborators in a variety of different, uh, of different arenas. Uh, one of the things that we have done uh, here uh, in Panama is to think about identity, is to work with them on thinking about the question of identity. As I mentioned, these populations are of West Indian descent, so they're English speaking, yes? Right? English speaking population in a Spanish speaking country. Okay, um, so they, that's already a conflict. And as you know, again, the generational transfer issue, so the older generation speaks Spanish, the younger generation speaks the older generation speaks English, the younger generation speaks Spanish, and the older generation complains that the younger generation don't want to learn English, <laughs> right? So this is the situation that we are confronting, and so on the ground in Panama, we're very much uh, helping with that. But because of the, situ the, the context, the history that they have there, um, there are differences in terms of identity. So what we find is that the older generation will say very clearly, I am West Indian. Right? I am, I am black, I am West Indian. The younger generation has, is confronting a different set of issues. Right? So their notion of identity uh, is very different. So that's part of what can come out of this work, is that we can then say to a community organization, here is a program that we've created based on what we found through these interviews that can help you bridge the gap between the older generation and the younger generation. Right, because now we've gathered uh, data, we've gathered, uh, we've gathered actual information uh, going forward. I've talked a little bit about Afro-Latin Latin American communities in Panama. So let's think a little bit about uh, Middle Tennessee. I want to tell you what we're doing here in Middle Tennessee. Uh, decided to start our work here in Middle Tennessee with a course a new course, uh, a new course series at Vanderbilt, which I hope you will participate in, connect with, or ask about, is called Music City Perspectives. And the goal of that course is to bring Vanderbilt students into contact with the stories and knowledge that are available here in the city. So that we have individuals from the community coming into the classroom. We have students conducting research at the library and in other places based on the material that they have gained and producing research projects that we will then return to the community. So at the end of this semester, you'll see research projects produced by the students that are in this, uh, that are in this class. Um, and that will be the case going forward. So if you are interested in participating in that or in connecting with that, or if you have a particular aspect of Middle Tennessee history that you want us to, uh, to focus on or tell, uh, talk more about, please feel free to, to connect, uh, connect with us. Um, our major work now is in uh, Rutherford County. And we have partners out there such as the Bradley Academy, the uh, Murfreesboro Parks and Recreation, uh, and we are building programs for and with them. We are currently conducting interviews there, um, and we'll, we expect we have one on Friday with a 97-year-old woman, um, and we look forward to being able to utilize that material, uh, that material going forward. Uh, as I said, we are continuing to have work in, uh, have an impact on teachers locally through uh, the Center for Latin American Studies and our other, our other funders, and uh, we hope to continue to build uh, forward. Um, I will stop there, um, but I hope that you all will ask questions. There's a lot of information to be had and a lot of information that I know that you have that would be, uh, that would be of benefit to us. Uh, conversation is central to voices from our America, and I hope that you will contribute um, your voices uh, and or at the, at the very least uh, convey the value and importance of your voices to your uh, to your family members. So thank you very much. reminded of um, a time when I was driving uh, in Texas. I was about 30 miles from the Mexican border and uh, I was driving with my sons and uh, we were stopped at some sort of roadblock and uh, asked for our papers. Um, and well I had my Tennessee driver's license and they ran that and they discovered that I wasn't actually 
an American citizen. Um, so they wanted my passport, which was in Nashville. Um, and so they said, well, uh, can someone break into your house and, and <laughs> mail it to and us it. Uh, so that we can see this? I said, well, you know, I don't know anyone who's got my key and, and so on. Uh, and, and then and he looked at me very hard and he said, you know, you're an alien. Uh, and, I, and I thought, well, that's weird. I'm feeling, you know, I pay taxes. Um, and I, I feel quite at home here. And I looked at him and I thought, you know, you don't think you're an alien. You think you're you know, a full-blooded American. He, he, looked, he looked kind of an alien to me. And it, it struck me that I'm looking around at all the other Americans around here, around here and around there, and I thought, you've all come from somewhere else, or your parents have, your grandparents have. I mean, aren't we all in, in some sort of way aliens uh, here, or we have a, a com more complex identity than, than, uh, than it might seem? So that's just a, a way of asking you <laughs> a question, because I know you were born in, born in Jamaica, mm -hmm. and uh, you went back and forth for a bit, and now you're a uh, fully-fledged English Professor <laughs> in in Tennessee and an American citizen. I mean, what what, what sort of um, sense of identity do you carry around with you? Because I'm sure that must inform <laughs> some of the work you're doing. Sure. Thank you for that um, for that question. So, um, I my ident identity is very complex. In a nutshell, I define myself as a black Jamargerian. Um, <laughs> I created that term when I was eight. <laughs> Um, that would be Jamaican, American, and Nigerian. My father is Nigerian, my mother is Jamaican. I was born and raised in Jamaica, but as I was explaining to uh, Professor Wood before, I spent summers in the U.S. at summer camp, learning how to be American and being American. So all of that uh, in my life. Um, I actually, we actually have audio cassette of me speaking very deep Jamaican patois um, when I was a little girl and then switching back into American, uh, American speech. Uh, saying honey child and all of that. Uh, it was very, <laughs> so I, my, my identity is mixed and it really depends on where I am and who I'm, who I'm speaking with. Um, I'm speaking with you right now. I, I gave a presentation at Cheekwood uh, of, uh, last month and I was performing some Jamaican poetry at that time. And once, once I perform that poetry, then my tongue gets all screwed up and then I start speaking to the audience in, in, with my Jamaican accent. So if you ask the right question, my tongue will get, uh, twisted and you'll, you'll hear more of that. So my identity is uh, quite complex, so that's why I'm always interested in uh, all of our identities because I feel like every person has within them uh, multiple streams of identity and history. Even if you say, I, born, I was born in Nashville, I've been in Nashville forever, yeah, but how did people come to Nashville? Uh, which side of the war were, you know, were, were your family members on? That matters, right, because that gets passed down between generations. You hear the story of great-grandfather who wore the blue, um, but then he knew someone on the other side and he had to go, and go back and forth. So everyone carries within them multiplicity, and I'm able to see that and connect with that because of my own uh, multiplicity. Well, you, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the uh, the Civil War, and I, I was going to ask you a question um, about uh, which connects up with war, um, and it's about narrative mm -hmm. and about the way in which you're uh, drawing out of people stories, their their stories, their their histories, their personal ways of understanding the world. And I was thinking back to a conversation I had with a an Irish philosophical friend of mine who works a great deal on narrative and, and thinks of narrative as central to identity, meaning, and everything else. Uh, but he said there is a, or there can be a darker side mm -hmm. to, to narrative uh, mm -hmm. and to stories. Mm -hmm. And he told me about uh, Northern Ireland and about the way in which a lot of the people that he knows there who are either you know, typically either Catholic or Protestant uh, have their stories. And those stories are very much tied up with a very partisan and um, often you might say distorted or narrow view of the world in which they, those stories are not emancipating at all right. but uh, are tying them into a, a closed little world. Right. So I, 
I'm asking you a sort of critical question here Definitely. about um, how you handle the narratives that, that you get from people Absolutely. and whether they are, because in, in many ways to take someone's narrative is a form of respect right. and a form of honoring who they take themselves to be. But do you not sometimes find people whose sense of themselves is, mm -hmm. is tragic and limited? Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, this is the darker side. Yes. Yes. Kind of question. Ab absolutely, absolutely. But that's, I mean, for me as a, again, the, the, I made the distinction with me as a, as a literary scholar. I see, I take the narrative as a representation of the person's self. And that's what differentiates, in my eyes, the work we're doing in, with Voices from Our America from oral history. So when, I cap when, when we interview someone, we are not then taking that narrative to the archives to see if that person was telling us true factually uh, factually based or factually correct information. For example, one of the things we've been um, digging up for a long time and just haven't been able to find anything, the young lady at the end talks about how the word chombo came to be. Um, that's her narrative of how that word, how that word came, into, came into being. Uh, and we all package ourselves in a, certain, uh, in a certain way. And again, that to me is why you want to have scholars involved in helping with the intergenerational transmission of the narrative so that um, there is some kind of critical perspective included in that transmission. So this is what your grandma says is the story. This is from her perspective. Why would she think that? Why would she, what, what uh, aspects of her life and her history would have led her to that understanding? rather than looking at that narrative of these are the facts, these are the pure facts, but what does that tell us about who your grandmother is and who she wants you to think that, that she is? Um, your, your question also raises one of the queries that always comes up with this project. Are you going to analyze the narratives? Um, my contract with, with the people that I interview in my, in my uh, mind is that I am not going to violate uh, your narrative by saying, oh, actually, this person told us a lie. <laughs> right? That's not what, what, what we're doing. There are other scholars can come, when, once we create the digital libraries, other scholars and others are welcome to come and analyze and do that. But as the, the person gathering a narrative, as the project gathering the narrative, I see it as a contract uh, with, that, with that person. But certainly, as you're listening to people talk, you can see the self-construction implicit in it. And that's why I'd say the power of autobiography. Because when we tell stories about ourselves, we are telling stories about ourselves. Right. I think it's time we uh, ask the audience to uh, ask you questions. Um, and there's a lady over here. Can you share an example of the types of questions? Okay. Sure. Can you share an example? Sure, sure. One, uh, for example, with um, uh, African American populations, um, instead of, we, we will ask a question about childhood background, how did you grow up, right? And instead of, ask, instead of only asking you about your experience, I will ask you about what stories came down in your family about X person. So were you in the military? Was your grandfather in the military? Did you ever hear tell of what he did in the military? So that way you, you're capturing not so much factual information, but you're capturing the, the, the sense of history that is embedded within that person's, uh, within that person's mind. Um, I have, we have, as I said, I have students doing, doing interviews and talking with people. One of the things I talk with my students about, because they always just want to ask the five questions that relate directly to their research projects. And I keep saying, no, it's important to, to, to understand someone's history, what, was their, what were their school experiences like, who were their parents, who were their grandparents, before you start asking about this particular event or this particular issue. Because without that, you're just, uh, you, you're getting a, little, a, a snapshot. So it's really a holistic, a holistic perspective. Okay, sure, sure. So uh, as that connects exactly with this, we, when we tell a story, we're telling stories about ourselves, right? So there is always, with all of us, when we tell the narrative of ourselves, there's going to be a gap. Uh, there's going to be something that we are not going to talk about. 
Uh, so if by understanding a particular community, by researching the history of a community, I can get a sense of which things may be touchy subjects, which things may be issues, and so what things someone may not, either not want to talk about or with something that someone would want me to press in a certain way or would want me to frame the question in a certain way. So for example, if you look at the, the gentleman who was talking about he marched sometime when the sovereignty came, it's very confusing, right? You don't know what he's talking about. He said, I, I marched during the times when we were fighting for sovereignty, something, something, and then he kind of undoes, undoes it and basically says nothing happened. Part of what, he's talking about some very major things. There were people who died, there was a lot, a lot going on. So in the parts of the interview that you don't see here, we talk with him, what do you mean by marching? What kinds of things did you do? Um, what, what did sovereignty mean for you? Right? How old were you? And then we come back later, because he's someone who migrated from Panama to Canada. And part of the question is, did that have something to do with why he left? Right? So does that under... You know? It's a complex, it's a complex uh, dance. Uh, the gentleman in the middle. In addition to asking about family history, yeah. did you also ask about the family stories, the poems, the literature that is passed down through generations to our English professors? Sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, and we're, actually one of the, the grants I've gotten is, is, is to kind of go back and collect that information. Now with, with the Panamanian case, that's, uh, that's difficult, but here in, in Middle Tennessee, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we, I actually got uh, an autobiography just recently, um, and the, the last talk I gave, the people came up and said, oh, I've written an autobiography um, for my family, and certainly it's something that we ask for and we ask about. Um, the lady that we're interviewing on Saturday uh, who's 97, we, we went to her house as a pre, pre-test, like we always do, just go and um, build a relationship, found out that she's an artist, that she does watercolor painting. A black woman in Tennessee, born you know, that far back, did, did watercolors. So hopefully you'll be able to get uh, scans of that uh, and util utilize them. Uh, we have musicians and other, and other people, so absolutely. That's very important. Um, family Bibles. Uh, as you know, here in Tennessee are quite crucial. People write things in family Bibles as well. You look like you want... Yeah. Have there been any surprises about the impact on the youth when these stories are transmitted? And, and are there roles that you can play in this kind of research besides doing this sort of thing? Absolutely, absolutely. One of the things, one of the, the programs that we've done are student oral history uh, competitions. Um, so we have these longer, the longer narratives, the longer interviews that, that kind of we look at and everyone looks at, and so we know um, what, that in, what that includes. And so we have students, we have students do shorter interviews, students meaning high school students and uh, middle, middle school students do shorter interviews with that person. Uh, and then uh, they have to create a project. <coughs> Uh, a kind of multimedia project based on that person's based on that person's story. So, in terms of impact, when you see that happening, uh, and you see a young person, and, and we have there some photos of, of some of that of some of those experiences, it kind of puts a light bulb a light bulb on because it's a direct one to one connection. What I call living primary sources, putting students into contact with living primary sources uh, is is absolutely uh, absolutely vital vital and. For some students, it gives them a sense of grounding. Um, and we're hopefully going to see some of that here, uh, here in Middle Tennessee. Did that answer your question? Bill, I, I, yeah, Libby here. I noticed under education, you said yeah. K to 16. If yes. you, in this country, you usually say K to 12. Yes. Does that mean, uh, <laughs> does that mean that in Panama, mm -hmm. It includes a bachelor's degree. That's just my kind of trying to not, not have so many commas in, <laughs> in a sentence. Yeah. Yes, lady uh, over here in red. Can we see more of the video you showed at the beginning? Sure. Um, we were actually supposed to see an interview, and unfortunately te the, the technical uh, difficulties prevented us from uh, showing that. Is it available someplace? Mm -hmm. YouTube? Sure. <laughs> well, 
We are, uh, pub I, I will make it available, so I can give it to the library and they can, uh, so they can make it available with no, uh, with no problem. That's again part of why we do the consent forms. Um, you know, when you sit down with them, we have a consent form that says your interview we can use for the public and we can do different things with it, so we can certainly do that. We're in the process of creating a digital library right now where a ton of the interviews will be, uh, will be available also, and we hope to do the same here. <laughs> that, that's a great, great question. Um, for each sub-project, um, the results will be archived wherever the, my agreements, uh, agreements are. So the Panama Digital Library will be housed uh, here at Vanderbilt uh, with different Middle Tennessee communities. If I'm working with a museum or working with a library, they may want it archived in their, uh, on, their, on their site. Um, and so that, that is uh, things for the, the, lawyers to, the lawyers to work out. But I'm, and we are open to it being archived wherever is necessary. So there may be a particular community organization that wants it uh, in their in their archives, and that's uh, that's fine with me. Now, you know, the university may have <laughs> another viewpoint, um, but the the way the consent forms are, um, the the materials belong to me, and so I have the, the the choice to say to this community organization, you can store it on your site. <laughs> I know there's it makes it makes no sense. Panama and Middle Tennessee, I wanted to Sure, um, that's a great uh, great question as well. Um, I if it were up to me, I would do the world. Um, and and my colleague was just telling me I'm known as the Energizer Bunny uh, on campus <laughs> um, because I'm I'm interested in really truly uh, interested in all people and all stories. I live in Middle Tennessee. When I arrived here in 2006, I was blown away by the the range of uh, the range of experiences, the range of stories uh, that are that are present here. I grew up with my grandparents, so I was in Jamaica, in Jamaica, and so um, I was always listening to stories. This is the other important thing. My grandfather was a railway station master. This is very important. This may help to connect the two. Uh, he was a railway station master in Jamaica in the 1920s and 30s. So he would come back when I was growing up with him, because he was retired by the time I was growing up with him. With, he learned Portuguese. He learned Chinese. My grandfather was completely cosmopolitan. So growing up with him, I would always hear stories about Panama, hear stories about Portuguese, hear stories about everyone. So for me, the distance between Middle Tennessee and Panama is is really not uh, not that significant, but I understand that for everyone else, it's like, well, what is the relationship between between the two? From my perspective, I see intergenerational complexity between older generations and younger generations, and stories that older generation have that need to be conveyed uh, to the younger to the younger generations. Uh, and in a nutshell, that's that's where I see the connection. But it could just as well be um, I, I did some travel in, in New Orleans, uh, it's a template we've created that we can do with in, in relationship to any, any community um, and tweak it in relationship to their particular needs. But I realize it seems really far away, but that's the... <laughs> How do you take the people that you Great, yes, and I had, I, I, I cut a lot for, uh, for time. My, my assistant can tell you this was a very, very long, very, very long talk, <laughs> and I cut a lot. Um, part of what we do with respondents, we use uh, two particular sam what's called sampling methods, I guess, if we were using kind of scholarly terminology. Snowball sampling, which is simply that if I go to a community organization, they say, we know Mrs. Such and Such, who lives down the street, wants to have her story told, and I go to Mrs. Such and Such's house, and she has her cousin who comes over, and the cousin knows someone. We have no problem with following that, that trail. Snowball sampling in, in some other fields is really a horrible, evil thing, but uh, for us, it's, it's, it's okay. But what we find that happens with the snowball sampling is eventually you end up getting out of the outside of that group. Uh, so we do a lot of recruiting at festivals, community festivals, there's someone will show up who was not usually part of that community organization who just happens to be there. Events like this where you just, uh, you're just meeting people and talking with people. Um, there may be someone, someone here who knows someone um, that who's, who, who, uh, who is not necessarily part of your circle, but my friend who I'm from work knows someone, I think her grandfather or something. So um, those are the two ways in which we do sampling, the snowball sampling and just you know, divine intervention sampling. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I could ask you a question about, um, about the, the kinds of stories people tell you. Yeah. Um, is it that people sort of have them ready made yeah. and they're waiting to tell somebody? Or is it that when they're asked uh, to talk about themselves, maybe for the first time they start to think about who they are and how it all hangs together? Yeah. And about themselves in the process of talking to you 
so that, I mean, if that, if that happens, um, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of fascinated to know whether, you know, you all are living on a story, mm -hmm. or with a story, and whether you, what you would make of the opportunity to tell your story to somebody who was a really good listener. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm sort of fascinated to know whether yeah. the stories are just sitting there, waiting to be hatched, or whether they need to be grown. Uh, whether, whether talking to you actually changes people's lives. Right, both things happen. Uh, so uh, someone will schedule, will schedule an interview and they'll prepare uh, and, and think that they have their story packaged and ready to go. But again, because of what I was talking about in terms of the construction of the questionnaire, there are unexpected questions uh, that come. So we did an interview um, here locally, for example, last week. Um, where this person, I've been talking with them for months, so they know the interview is coming, they know it's, it's going to happen, and they, you know, we talked with them the night before, they were preparing uh, for it. But nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, tears ended up coming, things, it, he says to me that things came out in that interview that he did not expect. Um, and so there, the, 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 again, back to the questionnaire and the way it's, the way it's constructed and the types of things that it, asks about is not necessarily things that would be right on the top of your mind when you say someone is going to capture, uh, capture my story. Now certainly this is why we have the consent form. If you end up saying something that you then don't want made public, that you know, we, will, we will pull that out. But absolutely, both, both things uh, will happen. We have had a lot of, a lot of tears, uh, particularly with expatriates, um, people who have left one place and gone to another. We definitely will have, will have that. Also having audio and video and still photography around protects people's okay. Absolutely. And you couldn't hear what my colleague said. He said having audio and video around affects people's presentation. Right? So that makes a huge difference. But again, we try to account for that. Um, also having, depending on who's doing the interview, I try and I don't, I, just like this interview I was talking, I didn't conduct it. I don't conduct interviews with people who I know or I don't have c people conduct interviews with people who they know, who they know uh, well. So we try to manage that. But again, what we do is once it's gathered, you talk about how it, how it, how it came to be. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and that, I mean, that's a great, a great point because part of what we are trying to do is to just get people to value, value your own story and value other people's stories. If you don't want to do an interview with us, that's completely fine. But by being here, even the last event that we did, being here, you start thinking, okay, maybe I'll call up my, gr my granddaughter or someone and, and just start, start sharing, get things circulating. Right? Excellent. Some years ago, I did um, an audio tape with one of my uncles, mm -hmm. and even though he had had a stroke, when we started digging back into those years before, his memory seemed to be quite lucid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Later, I played that for a different uncle who had a different perspective on the same. One of the things I asked him was about yes. something that had happened. Do you find conflicting stories? Ooh. Constantly, endlessly, because again, when we're telling stories, we're telling stories. Uh, and again, that's what comes from literary studies. We look at autobiography and we understand autobiography to be crafted and to be about a decision that that person has made about self-presentation. Um, and so, so you have two uncles who have made some choices <laughs> about, <laughs> about autobiography, but it's difficult for you because if you're, ta you're doing family history, you're trying to say what happened. Um, but you just have to enjoy the experience of having sat with them. I had a student last year who did an interview with her grandmother. After a long time, her grandmother let her interview her. Uh, she sat down, did the interview with her grandmother, and at the end, her grandmother decided that she, could not, she would not let the grandchild use any of it. Uh, she had revealed some very major family secrets. So now this granddaughter had these family secrets that she knew that she could not do anything with, and this child was about to, <laughs> about to burst. But. Yeah. <laughs> I think this has to be our last question. Um, uh, so it may not be that they're trying to tell these different stories. Mm -hmm. It could be that they have different memories. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I had that experience. Both my sister and I were interviewed by Spielberg about mm -hmm. the Holocaust. Yeah. 